We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech on a given Tuesday morning. That's Cheryl Matsuoka. Cheryl, say hi. Good morning, everyone. Cheryl is the uh, executive of the Hawaii Restaurant Association, and uh, she has a lot to do with restaurants. We also have two restaurateurs, uh, Thomas Ray of Square Barrels and other restaurants we'll talk about, and Greg Ames of what TS restaurants uh, on Maui, but also on, on, on the big, big island, yeah. Um, uh, Kauai and, and Oahu. Okay, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, and we are, we are going to talk about their restaurants and how their restaurants are doing at the time of COVID. Welcome to the show, you guys. Really appreciate you thank being you. here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about these two guys. So it, it falls upon you, Cheryl, to introduce them in greater detail. Go for it. Yes. First, I'd like to introduce Greg Ames. He's with TS Restaurants. He's vice president of Maui. Greg, as you know, TS Restaurants is on Maui. They're Kauai. Oahu is, you know, the ones I'm familiar with. I go to Dukes and um, Hula, and then they also have restaurants in California. Um, I'd like to introduce Thomas Ray, who is with Square Barrels, and he has a new concept that he'll be opening up shortly. Right, Thomas? Yes, uh, any day now, well, any week now. And uh, Kaimuki is called Heiho House. It's an izakaya with a craft beer and craft cocktail focus. Yes, and Thomas is the, um, he's a partner and he's the co-owner of Square Barrows and that new concept. Okay, uh, let's, let's begin with you, Thomas, because it looks like you're older. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't really tell from here. Uh, so Thomas, uh, you know, I've been at uh, Square Barrels many, many times and I, I want to know, uh, is that restaurant open now? Are you open? And uh, if you are, I want to know the, the challenges for you. We are open. Um, the, well, the main challenge is, is reduced revenue. Even though we reopened on June 5th, um, it, we're not anywhere close to where we were prior to the crisis. Um, our lunches are down significantly because there's just no one in downtown. Um, our dinner is, is pretty good, but not anywhere close to where it was. And aside from that, um, creating consumer confidence and making sure people feel comfortable coming into the restaurant uh, was a challenge initially, but with the power of social media, people have come out and said, hey, they're doing a really good job. I always feel safe there, et cetera. So that's been really helpful for us. Oh, good. Um, so what, what percentage of your earlier um, you know, patronage do you, do you do now? 10%, 20%, 30%, what? Um, so every day is different. There's lots of fluctuations for us currently. So. On, on June 5th, when we reopened, it was a mad dash. Everyone wanted to go out and we, and they were buying higher priced items, you know, because they just wanted that, that luxury feeling of being in a restaurant. Um, but I'd say overall sales are still down about 50%, which is, you, you can't operate that way and survive. That's, that's below the break even. Yeah, definitely okay, way below well, it. Later on in the show, we'll talk about how you deal with that problem. Okay, uh, Greg, let's talk about your restaurants. Uh, you have a few of them. Um, some are open, some are not open. Can you talk about it? Absolutely. Uh, here on Maui, all of our restaurants are shuttered, unfortunately. Um, you know, the travel to, to Maui has been so restricted um, that the, the guest base just isn't here. In my conversations with other restaurateurs, um, most are closed, um, some are open. Uh, I only, to my knowledge, only know three restaurants that feel like they're profitable at this point. And quite a few of the fellow restaurateurs I know here on the island rushed to open and now are, are considering closing again. Um, we have uh, Dukes and Waikiki is open um, and doing a, a, a pretty good business for the most part, although it's not at all what they're used to. Um, we're fortunate that Dukes is such a, a popular place with such a great history and connection to Waikiki um, that, that uh, they've, they've really built themselves a good fan base. Um, the Hula Grill above them is still closed. And then on Kauai, um, Kiyoki's and Dukes Kauai are both open, but you know they're operating at a fraction of the volume that they were doing in, in the past as well. Um, Thomas is, is really correct that the, you know, the volumes we're operating, although we're really grateful to have what we, what we have and to be able to support our community, 
jobs for people or uh, you know being able to still contribute to charitable operations we're really happy with that um, however from an ongoing business model it's 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 challenging times jay yeah well we've talked to uh, other of your cohorts uh, earlier on the show and um, i get the feeling that if you have to close a second time uh, that really hurts um, and, and some and some restaurateurs have said if i've closed a second time i'm out of business i'm done uh, how do you feel about that? Is that is that a, is that a rule of thumb that you would ascribe to? I, I think it's a rule of thumb. I don't. I don't. I b I believe our company is is strong enough that we're not going to go through that. We have um, forty four years of culture and history and support of our community, and and I'm really hopeful that um, we're not going to go through that. However, I I totally agree that that that's an issue. Uh, anytime you close down a restaurant or ramp up a restaurant, the costs are, are pretty exorbitant. Um, you're going to have food in a walk-in cooler that you're going to need to donate or use somehow. Um, and then when you reopen, there's a training process and getting everything back uh, the way it was operating beforehand. Uh, what we've found is when a restaurant stays shuttered for two or three months, the equipment that's used to being used every single day doesn't always work the way that it did when you closed. Um, so there's a lot of repair and maintenance costs um, that you end up dealing with. And, you know, frankly, the, the bills don't stop when you close the doors. Mm -hmm. um, the is, anybody, is anybody forgiving you? You know, we're, we're in a lot of different um, stages with our landlords. We, we have um, you know, eight different locations here in Hawaii, and only a few are owned by the same people. Um, so some are being very forgiving and, and being accommodating, and um, some are in a different financial position. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, forcing their hands as well. It's, it's a very complicated situation, especially for these small um, landlords that maybe are, are uh, leaning on the banks to refinance in order to keep their property. So if yeah. they make concessions, then that's difficult for them. And we understand yeah. that. However, we need relief. What's your what's your break in uh, break, What's your break 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 your break even point? Sorry, um, as Thomas said, uh, for him at uh, Square Barrels, it was around fifty percent. What is it for you? And I suppose well, it differs from restaurant to restaurant. Eh? There's a difference oh. from restaurant to restaurant. I, I think it's important that we realize that the industry average profitability for a restaurant is 4.5%. So when you're operating at less than 5% margin, you know, even 90% volume is difficult, yeah. um, especially with the extra PPE and other things we're having to do in order to keep our restaurants safe for our, for our guests and our employees. So we're gaining costs and we're reducing revenue. So yeah. exactly where that number is changes, but the margins aren't aren't wide, Jay. Yeah, uh, I think Thomas, I maybe I misspoke on what your break-even point. What was it? Oh, uh, most restaurants are going to be like seventy to ninety percent occupancy to break even, I and mean, we have seen significant increases in our to-go business, but it's not enough to sustain us for years. It's uh, we we have to find a way to live and work with this sickness and to make people more comfortable coming into the restaurants and realize that it's not us that's causing this huge explosion of cases it's the it's the huge parties at our beach parks and and our parks that is causing the dramatic increase um i don't want to go on a tangent so i'll just let you take control of the side of the conversation but you know, you talk about confidence. You talk about making people feel comfortable, and I agree. I totally agree. That is a big factor. Um, before my wife and I are going to amble out again, uh, mm -hmm. we have not ambled out, and I think we're in the great majority of people who, you know, they see the numbers go up, they see all these spikes going on. That does not make us more comfortable. It makes us less comfortable about everything. So the question is, how do you make them comfortable? What is your magic list of comfort points? And I, I noticed that Greg is writing all this down, you know? So my, my, how do I make people more comfortable? We are doing everything that the CDC requires us to do, if not more. Um, I think 
obviously cases need to come down within our community for the consumer to be more comfortable. And we had a golden opportunity on June 5th when we had hardly any cases, but we destroyed that ourselves. And now we're in the position that we're in as an entire state of, the, of looking at the face of another shutdown. So what do you do for the restaurant experience? A lot of masks, a lot of distancing, every other table. What do you do? What are the, what are the steps you've taken to send that message to people? So partial indoor and outdoor seating, um, reduced seating at the bars, um, reservation only. I mean, we do accept walk-ins because we're just not filled to capacity. It's, it's not there yet. So we, we, all of our social media posts and our email blasts have said, hey, please make a reservation. But if you're only 20% full, I'm not going to turn that business away because they didn't call ahead. Right. Um, it's just for us, the consumer's not there. They're, they're not out, they're out more at night than they are at day, but we need that day business to survive as well, because that was a huge part of what made Square Barrels so dynamic is we made a, a tremendous amount of revenue during our lunch business, which acted like an insurance policy for our evening business, because downtown is not a very vibrant community at night. It's just pretty much us that's operating as a full service restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, have you changed your menu? Uh, have you, um, you know, changed things around in the kitchen and the offerings and the pricing? What? We, we reduced our menu um, to make it easier to execute. Uh, we utilized cross utilization of ingredients to kind of make it as dynamic as possible where we weren't having to order a lot of uh, not, not weird ingredients, extra ingredients that we didn't need to keep in our inventory. Um, as far as that we've always ran a very clean, healthy, safe kitchen. So we hadn't really changed anything in, in there. And our front of the house is wearing masks and they wipe the menus down. We have 10 menus that are, uh, that are wrapped uh, in plastic, like, a, like anything you would do in an office. And then we have our menu online as well. So the customer can go online, click on the menu and then it opens up there. Mm. Oh, uh, well, when you say online, is it, can he order online or just, just look online? Just look, just okay. look. But I mean, you can order through Bite Squad, DoorDash and uh, Uber Eats if you want delivery service. Are you, are you doing delivery service? Are you doing pickup and delivery? Yeah, yeah, with those three carriers and then people can always call ahead too. So is that, that robust? Is that um, constant? Is that helping you? It's definitely a help. Um, it's a huge help but it's it's not enough to survive long term are, are you at risk thomas <clears throat> are you at risk of um of going out well um i'm a really scrappy and feisty person uh played a lot of rugby um <laughs> i was a search and rescue swimmer in the united states navy before i did all this restaurant stuff um so i've already mentally put myself like I'm gonna fight to the death uh if I have to change if I have to chain myself to the front door so our landlord doesn't evict us I'll, I'll, I'm willing to do that so I'm not gonna go out of business because I just will not let that happen you know one one question that really that really begs itself here is that in all of this crisis you know because it's still completely a crisis there is no question about it we are yeah Cheryl's shaking her head yes Okay, you're opening a second restaurant, really? In kind yeah. of with all the risks that, that any new restaurant involves? Why are you doing that? Because I signed the lease in 2019, in July of 2019, <laughs> before anyone knew what COVID-19 was. And we already <laughs> sunk well over 150,000 into that, well over that. So you just got to keep fighting. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the Navy diver in you. Well, when a you know when a boxer gets punched in the face in the first round, he just doesn't go to the ground immediately. You got you got nine or ten more rounds left. Yeah. So what, what do you see as a um, you know as a scenario going forward? I mean, let's assume that we have more trouble, but let's assume also that somewhere along the line, I, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump about this, but somewhere along the line things get better, um, and you can sort of brave the storm. Um, what do you see in the future for Square Barrels and the Kaimuki restaurant? That's a, that's a really difficult question because it's a lot of speculation and just so many different scenarios. Um, I, I, I see a very positive, vibrant future 
if we can come to a speedy resolution of this system. But, you know, why are people going to go work in downtown or why are companies going to continue to lease office space when all these articles are coming out about the benefits of working from home? And now we've been forced to do that for five months. So I think, what is it? I think um, First Hawaiian Bank has already decided that they're going to close a lot of their office space downtown. And I yeah. could be wrong on that. You know, I'm hearing that secondhand. Well, I, I want to come back to, uh, you know, one element of that, the future is how, how this uh, COVID experience will, will reimagine, re require you to reimagine your restaurant, restaurants going forward. But I'm, I'm not asking that yet. I want to talk first to Greg. So Greg, tracking on the same things, um, you know, uh, what have you done um, to get by the problem of public confidence? What have you done to make these restaurants, um, you know, appear uh, safe uh, and, and give customers comfort uh, to come around? Right. Um, yeah, Jay, you know, it, sure, it's appearing safe, but it's, but it's really being safe. And, and, and that's a commitment that we've taken on as a company since we knew that this was going to be an issue. Um, you know, we actually have an 18 page uh, COVID-19 playbook that's been distributed to all of our restaurants. Um, all of our employees have access to it. We take um, temperatures at the beginning of shifts. We question our employees to see that they're not exhibiting any symptoms. Um, we've gone to QR codes that we use on our tables. So we either have single use paper menus or you have a QR code on your table that you can scan on your phone if you don't wanna to touch uh, even a, a single use menu. So you can instantly pull up and um, understand what's available. We've limited contact with the tables. It's been a big change for us. We're, we're really used to that constant interaction with our guests that we are hoping to make our friends. Um, and now we've had to take a little bit different approach where maybe we won't go to a table quite as much. Um, we also have contactless um, payment options. So you can scan a QR code at the bottom of your receipt and pay for it on your phone versus needing to hand a credit card to someone. Um, we have individuals that are dedicated in each restaurant to keep them clean. Uh, I saw a picture the other day of a vest that one of our uh, individuals on um, Oahu who busses tables and on the back of it, it said COVID killer. So you know, we're taking this really, really seriously. And um, you know, anything we can possibly do, um, not only to project that we're, that we're making a safe environment, but to truly make a safe environment um, is what we're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the efforts our company's made. It, it has been a challenge to reimagine. Uh, I'm sure. Well, I, and I want to talk uh, in a minute about how these things you've done may become permanently part of the firmament for your restaurant and others. So Cheryl, are these guys a, a representative sample of what's going on in the community? I mean, you touch a lot of restaurants. Uh, how, how, how do they fit, you know, in the, in the, in the larger sample of restaurants? They totally are the exact models. You have people like Thomas Ray with the individual restaurant now trying to do maybe another concept. Not everybody is as brave as Thomas, you know, who will, who will step in and, and try to do a different concept. You have a lot of those restaurants, right? And we call them mom and pops. But like Thomas is really and truly a mom and pop. I mean, a single co-owner, one location type of restaurant. And then you've got Greg who represents you know, the entrepreneurial spirit where they have numerous and they've been so successful. To, Greg, how many years, like 40 years? 40, well, I think we're at 44 years at this point, Cheryl. We're at 43 yeah. or 44. COVID has made me lose a little bit of track of time. Yeah. But we, and, and I thought that Thomas looked older, but maybe I was wrong about that. <laughs> I haven't been <laughs> over 44 years though. <laughs> 44 so, years Cheryl, of being- Cheryl, you know, you up. actually have two different kinds of markets here today on this show. Uh, you know, because yes. Thomas, uh, Thomas is a market that I'm very familiar with. In fact, I've, I've eaten at Square Barrels many, 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 many times. This is before- Me COVID. too. Uh, okay, and, and that's a downtown, you know, businessman's woman's restaurant. And uh, the same people come in on a regular basis. 
it's like a rendezvous point for, for downtown, or it has been a rendezvous point for downtown. Now, it's, I think it's different with Greg. I think his restaurants are for tourists in large part. I'm sure there's lots of local patronage too, but when I, when I think of Dukes, I, I think of Nietzsche, I think of um, tourists. And uh, that's a real stress because there are what, six or 700 tourists coming every day and somehow he manages to get them all to come to Dukes. <laughs> I don't know how he does that, but this, this, those are two different markets. And so my question to you, Cheryl, is which one, in general, not necessarily these guys, but which one is doing better in the time of COVID? Oh gosh, that's a that's a tough question. You know, I would I would have to say, gosh, guys, you got to help me here. I would I would have. There's to say, no there's no doing better. We're all like we're all I've, we're all I've seen people. Yeah, so go I've ahead. Seen people go like, ahead, Thomas. I've seen people, you know, like a restaurant will announce that they're closing for health reasons or whatever, and then people will comment in the feed, that's great putting profits uh, or putting health and safety over profits. There's no profits. So I'm just going to say that right now. There is no profits to be had. So the restaurants that are open and haven't shut down are doing that purely for survival mode. Because exactly. if they shutter, they know they will not reopen. And that's uh, another reason why I put that in my head. We will not shutter. Whether I have to chain myself to the front door to argue with <laughs> landlords, we are not going to do it. Because I've put my, I'm, I haven't been in the restaurant industry for 40 years or 30 years. Like, I'm still stacking my chips up. So everything that I have is super fragile right now. And I know you've seen my two kids run back and forth since we started this, this, um, this Zoom. So everything I have to do is for their lives. It's not about me at this point. It's literally to make sure my family is safe and has a good quality of life. And well, our uh, customers are safe. Greg, let me, let me ask you, do you have a sense of, um, you know, which market is better to be in right now? Because uh, we have very limited tourists um, and on the other hand, um, you know, as is clear from Thomas's experience, we have very limited downtown business people that come around. So which one, which one you like right. better right now? Uh, you know, I, I agree with Thomas. There's, there's no better. Both are difficult. Um, we, we definitely appreciate the Kamaina business that, that we receive. Um, and I, I think he is a little bit of a misnomer out there that, you know, when you think of TS Red, that were entirely tourist driven. We do have a large tourist component, absolutely. Um, but we have a large Kamaina following as well. And, and we're really proud of that. You know, right now we're still doing, doing okay business on Kauai. Well, Kauai hasn't been open to tourists for quite a long time. Um, and yet people are still coming in and dining. Um, I think on Oahu right now, uh, the the response of the, the oh, resident of Oahu is, hey, let's let's head down to Waikiki where we normally, you know, have a little difficulty finding a parking space or or getting into a restaurant. Let's take advantage of it. Yeah, see the raw benefits. Yeah, <laughs> right. Let's take advantage very, very of that few. beautiful beach right now. <laughs> so you know, but but here on Maui, we we kind of have a a, a different experience. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all, all the kind of micro markets are a little different and yeah. we're, we're trying to figure out how to navigate them. And there's no roadmap for this, Jay. You know, okay, but let me ask you my, my most, my most um, futuresque question. And that is, uh, how is all this gonna, you know, visit permanent changes, your restaurants and for that matter, the restaurant industry in Hawaii? Because, you know, as Cheryl and I have talked about before, Hawaii loves restaurants. Local people love restaurants. We have more restaurants that come and go per capita than anywhere I've ever lived in. Um, so um, it's, it's going to come back. So what changes do you think we'll find? Um, I, I don't think that the safety concerns are going to go away anytime soon. I, I think that there has been a long enough stretch of this. If this was a two week issue, um, I think people would have said, okay, let's put it behind us. But I, but I think we're at the place um, where we can expect that the safety and sanitation concerns are going to stick around for quite a while. I believe that this has been a uh, time of creative destruction 
And we've been forced to think about new ways to do business, whether it's contactless payment or whether it's QR codes, um, whether it's enhanced takeout models um, or maybe pre-ordering. Um, we're, we're not exactly sure what this is gonna look like on the other side, but to think that it's not going to change it just isn't realistic. Yeah. There will be some substantive you, changes. Will all your restaurants uh, survive, do you think, or will some of them have to go? I, I think we're all going to survive. Um, I, I don't think that that is indicative of our industry. Um, I, I feel like a large failure rate for the restaurant hospitality industry is going to happen. Um, we just happen to be in the fortunate position of, I, I believe that, that we're going to get through this okay. It's just going to be a little bit of a rocky road. Uh, Thomas, uh, how, how do you think your restaurant and for that matter, the industry will change when we come through this? And if you don't want to answer the question, why don't you bring in your, you know, your other guest that you were just talking to and have him answer. <laughs> my, my little boy. Um, <laughs> I think, I think Greg hit the nail on the head with everything he talked about the changes. Um, uh, 900 businesses have already closed and recent projections say that there's going to be 5,000 businesses that closed because of this crisis in the state of Hawaii, 1500 closed during 2008. So, our leaders need to come together and make clear, decisive action to prevent as much of the hemorrhaging of our economy as possible. And, and I want to prove all those economists and all the people who wrote those articles wrong. So it's important that we support each other, uh, visit the local businesses as much as possible over a large chain, because those chains are huge, huge corporations that will survive this crisis. So please support locally independent owned businesses. Yeah, one, one really profound point that you've touched on, what I'd like to visit with you, <clears throat> is that it's derivative for you. In other words, if the economy downtown is doing really well, you're going to do better because you are there and they come right. to see you. Uh, <clears throat> if the economy in, in general is in the tank and there's nobody downtown, which is the case right now, that hurts you more. So mm -hmm. you, you don't, you're not necessarily the, the master of your own fate here. Um, you you are um, um, you know a derivative function of the economy in general, and so uh, go ahead. Entrepreneurs have to be dynamic, though, so we'll have to figure it out one way or the other until the economy improves. Improves, and like I said, we're not going to go out of business. I won't let that happen. So it's how do we think dynamically and 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 jump over those hurdles that are presented. You know, I think this is a time. Uh, I'm sure Cheryl will agree with me. This is a time when. Hawaii, which is, this is not Hawaii's, you know, default position, but Hawaii must love businesses. <clears throat> Hawaii must encourage every business and every businessman or woman is a hero. And we have to rebuild by encouraging them, you know, to stay the course, uh, as you were talking about, Thomas, and also build new businesses. The state, the legislature, the governor, every department, and every one of us. And that includes restaurants. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, restaurants are, in, in a sense, is, uh, uh, it's easy because you can touch and feel the restaurant. You can see that business. You can in, you know, be part of it. And that makes it something you can relate to. Okay, anyway, Cheryl, it's time for you to close. So why don't you summarize what we've learned here today and, uh, and thank these gentlemen, all right? I want to thank, yes, Greg Ames from Maui. He jumped on and he represents TS Restaurants. Thomas Ray, who jumped on and he's, like he said, entrepreneur spirit, opening a second concept in Kaimaki on top of his square barrels. The Hawaii Restaurant Association is a resource. If you're in the industry and you're not receiving our email updates, I post and the guys will tell you. Sometimes I'm spamming people too much. Department of Health, what the mayors are saying, what the governors are saying, all the information from the National Restaurant Association, subscribe to our e emails, it's free. Okay, so you guys wanna mention any websites? Now's the time. Oh, absolutely, um, tsrestaurants.com, easy, easy place to go. So T is in Tom, S is in Sally, restaurants.com, and that will provide you links to all of our, our restaurants. Um, I, I would like to really thank you, Jay, for having us on the show and 
thank you, Cheryl, for thinking of us to be a part of it and, and, and uh, getting in Jay's ear to invite us. <laughs> thank you, Greg Ames. Uh, thank you, Thomas Ray. Appreciate you being here and sharing with us and, um, you know, and, and, and toughing it out in a hard time. Thank you so much. And thank you, Cheryl. Thank Aloha, you, you guys. Yeah, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.